Hello, uh, Richie Owens here again, and this segment is fiscal policy. So uh, quite a nice little segment, just as with monetary policy, if you've seen that one already. Uh, we've seen a lot of this fiscal policy employed over the last decade or so. Uh, so you should be familiar with the terms, but if you're not, let's go through the basics, then look at how it should work and some limitations. And finally, we'll just tie it off by comparing fiscal and monetary policy at the end and their impacts. But to begin with, let's get the basics, expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy. We are talking for fiscal policy, G and T, government spending, taxation. So if we're being expansionary, we are going to increase government spending. That's the G of C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So it directly impacts GDP. Decrease taxes. Well, decreasing taxes, that will increase personal disposable income. And if you increase personal disposable income, that should increase consumption. So you're hitting government spending directly and via taxes, consumption. Boost spending, cut taxes, that's expansionary. On the other hand, if you want to be contractionary, you cut spending and increase taxation. Now, the other important aspect to look at, if we start to spend, spend, spend as a government and cut taxes, then that's going to have an impact on the budget deficit. So expansionary policy will increase the budget deficit. Contractionary should decrease it. Right, they're the basics. Next up, uh, return to Keynesian economists for a while. Then we'll compare to monetarists. And I would just put a line across this slide and pay a little bit of attention towards the bottom on automatic stabilizers, because that is interesting. Uh, but what do Keynesians think, first of all? They believe discretionary fiscal policy can stabilize the economy. And that's the key word. Discretionary, obviously, meaning you are choosing to engage in this behavior. This ties directly back to the reading of business cycles, where the Keynesian school says we could be stuck in a recession because wages are sticky. Therefore, it is on the government to kickstart aggregate demand by intervening. And one policy you can use is fiscal policy. So you combat recessions by increasing spending, cutting taxes, and vice versa. As opposed to monetarists, who believe that is a temporary kick, don't do it. What you should do instead, according to the monetarist school, is just keep a sensible, predictable, credible monetary policy. That will dampen cycles. You're risking making it worse if you intervene. So, fiscal policy, a nice little contrast, and it ties back to business cycles as well in that reading. But focus as well at the bottom of this slide on automatic stablers. I would just compare and contrast discretionary and automatic. So automatic stabilizers, it says there in parentheses, taxes and transfer payments. So tax revenues for the government and government spending in the form of transfer payments, food stamps, unemployment benefits, things like that. Well, let's go back to our previous slide, thinking in terms of contractionary and expansionary. Well, let's imagine we are trying to be expansionary. We're trying to get out of a recession. We're trying to get out of a recession. What Keynesian economists say is, let's be expansionary. Government spending up, tax revenue down. Well, let's think of what happens during a recession anyway. If we're in a recession, transfer payments have increased. Unemployment benefit, food stamps, and so on. Nobody in a recession is making any profits, just to exaggerate. Profits are a lot lower, so tax revenues fall. So all this is saying is automatically, government spending will have increased and tax revenues will have fallen. So your budget deficit will increase during a recession point of this, you can't simply look at what's happening to a budget deficit and decide that this government is definitely engaging in discretionary, discretionary fiscal policy. What you may be seeing the effect of are just automatic stabilizers. So know the difference between those two. All right, next up, the objectives. What are we trying to do? Well, the big one, as we've talked about, influence aggregate demand and economic growth. That's what the Keynesian school is talking about. Redistributing wealth, obviously via government spending taxation, by definition, and affect the allocation of resources to different sectors of the economy. So obviously they can do that 
with their government spending, where they allocate it, and tax breaks or penalties in various different sectors. So I don't think that slide's too stressful. Write that list down, learn it. Never need to think about it again. All right, tools. Uh, let's just break down what we mean by government spending. Three types to look at. First one, transfer payments. We've just talked about a little bit. That's payments by the government to redistribute wealth, unemployment, food stamps, etc. Then we can break down their other spending, if you like, their discretionary spending, into current and capital. Current goods and services, capital spending. Well, we're trying to increase future productivity. So we are building infrastructure, research, development of new technologies. Obviously, the benefit there is you are going to hopefully increase future GDP. They are our spending tools. Uh, the other side, taxation. Direct and indirect. A direct tax takes time to implement. So getting the rules changed on income or wealth taxes is obviously a lengthy or potentially a lengthy political process. Indirect on goods and services, very quick to implement to raise revenue. So bang, you can just put a tax on tobacco, a tax on alcohol straight away and start to bring in that revenue. So we've seen what we're trying to do with fiscal policy and the tools that are available to us. How does it work? Well, there's good news. To a certain extent, fiscal policy is magical. And we can prove that by looking at the multipliers. So let's think, first of all, government spending. Government spending, we know, is part of aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So if you increase government spending, you increase G, and you have therefore increased aggregate demand. Hooray. So in the example we've got here, we are going to increase government spending by 100 billion. Hooray, that boosts G. However, there is a multiplier effect because it creates more spending. Let's say what the government did was go down to its local grocery store and spend $100 billion on groceries. Now that owner of the grocery store has had a massive windfall and has $100 billion. The likelihood is they're going to go and spend quite a lot of that. So some of that $100 billion turns into consumption, which is part of aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So that grocery store owner, let's say, goes down to their local bar and spends a good chunk of that $100 billion. That goes to the owner of the bar, who will then go and consume, and so on and so on. It's an iterative process. Now, can we work out what that boost to consumption will be? Yes, we can. We have this formula, the fiscal multiplier. It is 1 over 1 minus MPC into 1 minus T. Now, be careful here. Look at the LOS. It's described. So the examiner is not specifically asking you to learn a formula and to calculate. We've put the numbers in to highlight it because I think it's helpful. But focus first of all on the idea behind this and certainly what's in there. The 1 minus T, as always in this syllabus, is 1 minus the tax rate. So we're looking for after tax. The MPC, that is the marginal propensity to consume. So the C is your consumption. Here it's 0.8. So what we're saying is... For every dollar that your individual ends up with in their pocket, they will spend 80 cents of it. There is also such a beast as the marginal propensity to save. In this case, that would be 0.2. For every dollar, they're spending 80 cents and saving 20. Tax rate, 25%. We can put those on the bottom of this equation, 1 over 1 minus. So 0.8 is your 1 minus T. Uh, sorry. 0.8 is your marginal propensity to consume. Uh, 1 minus T is 1 minus your 0.25. Times the 100 billion increase, what that tells us is taking into account all of the extra consumption as well, a 100 billion increase in government spending should actually increase aggregate demand by $250 billion. Bonus. Fiscal policy seems like the greatest thing in the world but cool your jets. There is also a tax effect. Just like increasing government spending will boost consumption, 
When we start to look at taxes, if you increase tax, unfortunately, that hurts consumption. So, sticking here, and we've done this on purpose. These things are planned. We've got a tax increase of 100 billion. If you notice, that is the exact same figure as our increase in government spending on the previous slide. So this is a balanced budget. We've increased government spending by 100 billion, but financed it with tax revenues of 100 billion. So, balanced budget. What happens with the tax increase? Well, you are now taking $100 billion away from people. That means they have less to spend and it will reduce consumption. But it will only reduce consumption by the MPC, which was 0.8. So not all of that $100 billion would have been spent, only 80% of it. So you're only hitting consumption by 80 billion. The multiplier effect is exactly the same. We have the exact same 2.5, same formula from the previous page, but it's only applied to the 80 billion of consumption that's been reduced, meaning a 100 billion tax increase with a multiplier of 2.5 and an MPC of 0.8 would reduce GDP by 200 billion. The good news and why fiscal policy is kind of magic, this was a balanced budget. 100 billion spending, 100 billion tax, the impact, boost aggregate demand by 250 from the government spending, reduce it by only 200 from the tax. A balanced budget approach actually increased aggregate demand by 50 billion. We can say the balanced budget multiplier is positive. Now that's great news. It means all governments ever have to do is keep an absolutely balanced budget, no budget deficit, and they will keep increasing aggregate demand. Obviously, this is theoretical. All right, let's go on to problems. Because clearly, what we just talked about hasn't happened over the history of time. Certain governments around the world do have just a tiny little budget deficit going on. So, there are obviously limitations. So, first one we'll look at is the Ricardian equivalence. Uh, let's go through the logic. Tax decrease. Okay, what's the point of a tax decrease? Well, we are looking at tax decreases, so we're talking expansionary fiscal policy. Trying to kickstart the economy. Idea is cut taxes, increase consumption. However, people start to think this through. Why are you giving me a big, juicy tax decrease? Well, clearly, if you're giving me a decrease now, you're going to have to finance that in the future somehow, and the only way you're going to do that is to put my taxes up in the future. So, if you're going to put my taxes up in the future, I'm going to take this extra cash I've got today from this tax decrease and I'm going to save it. What you actually do is blunt this impact, reduce the expansionary impact, because people start to save. They change their marginal propensity to save and consume. And you might get to the stage where the increase in their saving just offsets the impact of the tax decrease, in which case you have the Ricardian equivalence. And if a government tries to increase spending by funding it with debt, you actually have no impact on aggregate demand whatsoever. That would be a shame. Next up, let's have a look at the government debt ratio. So, quite simply, that is government debt to GDP. And our question here in the syllabus really is, is this a problem? Because fiscal policy is telling us if we are in a recession, we should be raising spending, we should be cutting taxes, we will have a budget deficit. So if we're raising spending and financing it by debt, you could get to a stage where this debt ratio is 80, 85, 90, 95%. And when I say could get there, obviously we've seen exactly that happen. Now, where's this ratio going? Well, just be able to explain this to the examiner. Real interest rates. If the real interest rate on government debt is less than the real rate of growth, 
that debt ratio rather will decrease over time. This ties back to the chat on monetary policy. This gives you an incentive to start thinking about manipulating the economy if you do have very high levels of government debt. And obviously the opposite is also true. If that rate is greater than the real rate of growth, then that ratio will increase. So we're looking at the interest rate increasing your debt and obviously growth increasing the GDP. So just look at the effect on the numerator and the denominator. But we need to talk about in this little segment whether or not having a huge amount of government debt, a big deficit, is there a good or a bad thing. So here is the chat about budget deficits. Reasons to be concerned. So this is obviously classic for the exam. Which of the following is a concern, which is not a concern? And we have two lists that we're going to look at. These are the reasons we should be concerned if our government has ended up with a huge budget deficit. Number one, they're going to have to finance that, and that means higher future taxes. Higher future taxes will decrease GDP growth. Nice, simple logic. And just be sensible with these lists when you're looking to come and review and revise and practice effectively. If you read that and it makes perfect sense, you don't need to write it down on a list anywhere. This is not an essay exam. So I think, yeah, if there's a big deficit, they're going to finance it with future taxes. That will decrease GDP. That makes sense to me. If I see that in the exam, I'll be able to spot it. Uh, secondly, government borrowing can drive up interest rates. This is the idea of crowding out. So let's say we are near full capacity. There is a finite pool of loanable funds. And if the government is using up all of that borrowing, there's a big demand for that finite pool. You can drive up interest rates and actually crowd out private investment. So, yes, we are going to start borrowing to spend. But the effect is rates are now too high for businesses to invest. And hence, in the C plus I plus G plus X minus M, the I starts to fall. So that offsets your attempted growth. So the budget deficit is actually a bad idea. And then thirdly, I think, again, this is really intuitive. At some point, debt becomes risky. Who knew? So if that's the case, your interest rates will rise. Just look over the last decade in the Eurozone. It became a, a monthly must-see TV event when any of these shaky Eurozone countries were trying to raise government debt. What is the interest rate that people are going to start demanding? And you start, saw rather rates going up 5, 6, 7, 8% for government debt. So people start to get concerned you're going to default or expand your monetary supply to get you out and cause inflation. And obviously things go badly from there. So we should be concerned about budget deficits. Or should we? We have three counter arguments. This is why I think it's a great little area for an exam question. Uh, arguments they're not concerning, number one. If it's financing capital investment, future GDP is higher. So we are capital spending, infrastructure, research, development. That should help future GDP. So let's not worry. Secondly, Ricardian equivalence. If the Ricardian equivalence holds, then the deficits don't matter because it just offsets. And thirdly, if we're below capacity, we are not going to crowd out. It's not going to happen because we have exhausted, sorry, we have inexhaustible, if you like, loanable funds. So fours and against, just make sure you can see the logic of all of those. Right. Genuine problems. We can argue all day about whether deficits are a concern or not, but there are certainly drawbacks to fiscal policy. Here's one lags. Recognition, action and impact. First of all, you've got to recognize that you actually need fiscal policy change. Know that we're heading into a recession. That can take a couple of quarters. Then you've got to get it into legislation. That can take who knows how long. And then once it's in there, you actually have to wait for it to have the intended effect. So you give me a tax cut. It has to start hitting my paycheck. Me start to realize after a couple of paychecks, yeah, I've got a bit more cash and I can go and consume. That process could take up to eight quarters, meaning it might kick in actually just when you're up the upswing anyway and make things worse. So if the lag is that long, it could actually be destabilizing. Other limitations. 
If we're already at full employment and you launch a fiscal stimulus, we saw this in the classic diagrams in another segment, all you'll do is raise prices. If we're below full employment due to supply shortages, well, link these last two points together. Again, tie it back to your classic diagrams, aggregate supply, demand, and so on. If it's a supply shortage, what are you doing? Well, supply shortages, cut back your short-run aggregate supply curve, force up prices. You end up with stagflation, higher prices and unemployment. If you try and get out of that with aggregate demand stimulus, all you do is force prices up even further. So we can't hit both unemployment and address inflation. So basic analysis, this just summarizes what we've looked at. Uh, what we should be doing obviously depends on the cycle. I agree with that. But second point is nice. An adjusted or full employment deficit amount can be used to adjust for the business cycle stage. That's talking about this idea of automatic stabilizers. So let's look at what our deficit is and where we would expect it to be because we're in a recession or a boom anyway. And then you can judge how much of that is actually due to discretionary policy. And hopefully by now we know the bottom two points, G up and tax down, expansionary, government spending down, tax up is contractionary. So we've hit fiscal policy. In another segment, you'll see monetary. Let's just finish off by looking at the two together. And here they are, policy interactions. Uh, looks like an intimidating slide, but that's actually a nice list. A couple of them are fairly straightforward, namely this one where they're both expansionary, and this one, where they're both contractionary. So the up arrow means expansionary monetary, expansionary fiscal. Well, it's going to be expansionary. Makes sense. Second one, they are both contractionary. Well, yep, it's going to bring down your growth. So they're fairly straightforward. The other two are more interesting. So in this third one here, I'll label it three. Monetary is expansionary. Fiscal contractionary. Well, the way to look at this, the monetary element will impact interest rates. Expansionary monetary, more cash in the economy, lower interest rates. So it's the monetary side that affects the interest rates. Expansionary monetary, rates are falling. The fiscal side, government spending, that will affect the public sector. So monetary is the interest rate, Fiscal is the public sector. So your monetary effect here is to bring down interest rates. So they will fall because your monetary is expansionary. As a result, consumption output and the private sector should expand. What you'd see alongside that as the fiscal effect is the public sector is shrinking at the expense of that private sector. Finally, number four, the opposite. Monetary is now contractionary, therefore interest rates will rise. But fiscal is expansionary. So the most likely impact is we will still see growth in aggregate demand. The public sector will expand due to that expansionary fiscal policy. So just be able to tell the examiner, identify the overall impacts of those two together.